Good morning, class. <laughs> Good morning, teacher. All right, I hope this audio is working. I know you all can hear me, but po hopefully people on YouTube can hear me as well. I'm on, I think. And so we, uh, we turn today, it's actually day two, session two, studying the Benedict Option. Uh, this chapter is entitled The Roots of the Crisis, and uh, coming from Canada to the south, I'd never seen kudzu before. <laughs> and when I saw kudzu, I thought, this is a crisis, and somewhere there's a root of this crisis that's very obviously hard to get out. Uh, but in order to address a problem, you've got to know what the problem is. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, you know, uh, the introduction in chapter one of the Benedict Option is very sort of sour and dour about w the state that we're in. This is an analysis of how did we get to this point. And we've got so much material to cover in the next 40 minutes that I don't know how to even say it. So, yes, this is going to be a speedboat skipping along the top of the water kind of review of, of 600 years of world history. So if you say, Father Paul, you missed something. Yes, I missed like a lot of stuff, but we're trying to skip through with the goal of asking where did we come from, how did we get here, is it possible, or how can we get back to where we were before, or can some of us get back to where we were before, how can we get back to a time of St. Benedict, that's, that's basically the, the, the goal of the Benedict Option, so here we are discussing the roots of the crisis. Before we do, we shall pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has committed to thy holy church the care and nurture of thy people, enlighten with thy wisdom those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of thy truth, they may worship thee and serve thee from generation to generation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Why? First of all, if you've never studied philosophy, it may seem irritating, uh, philosophy itself. I once uh, had, not an original thought, but a thought, why do people hate philosophy so much? Because philosophy is a slowing down of, of a thought process or even of the idea of progress and a, a beginning of a questioning of why do we think the way we think. And philosophy can even be a reversal of progress, seemingly. We're going backwards now to see how we used to think. But the goal is to figure out why we think the way we think now and uh, to have some idea of how best to progress into the future. Uh, it may seem to be all so much uh, discussing how many angels can dance on the head of a pin because in your mind you're thinking, aren't we just people? You know, we're just people. You know, people in Benedict's time were people. You wake up, you put one, one uh, leg of your pants on at a time, you tie your belt, you go and you work. What's the difference between 1,600 years ago and today? In fact, uh, there's quite a difference. So, <laughs> but what has not changed, I want, to keep, I want you to keep this in mind, reality itself has not changed. But our perception of reality has changed. This is a picture of St. Augustine of Hippo. And I want you to note a couple of things here. Number one, he is sitting as a ready writer, listening for the message of God to him, believing, in this picture you can see, he believes reality is outside himself, and he's listening for it as it comes in from the Lord himself, trying to interpret it for his people. That is a much different picture, that is 1,600 years ago, than today. <laughs> and you could say this is a funny picture. And uh, the idea is for it to be a little bit funny. I want you to note one thing. There is nothing less sacred about the soul of this man than sacred about the soul of St. Augustine. But the perception of reality has got 1,600 years of change between the two. So that this man, rather than looking out to God to hear from God what reality is, has discerned that it's whatever his desire is, is where the seat of reality is. Whatever feels good, do it, was, was, was the mentality of God. Of of the era that he's hearkening back to here. 
and you find that rather than looking out to God to hear about reality, he's looking out to his cell phone and taking a picture of himself. Something's different about this than what St. Augustine was doing. There is no icon of him holding a mirror out and looking up at a mirror to see what he looks like. But that's what we do now. How did we get from the one to the other? That's the whole point of discussing philosophy. Two to one. Two to one. I suppose, I suppose. No, yeah, we're getting, we're getting there, trust me, yeah. I find it uh, somewhat ironic as I look closer at this picture. His church says Bethel Woods uh, Center for the Arts. Bethel means house of God. And I don't know, it's not a prophetic picture. I just pulled it off of Google or something like that to try and uh, illustrate. But I thought, isn't that funny that the shirt he wears is about the house of God, that he actually is the house of God. But what a difference. Uh, you're, anyway, we can't linger, sorry, we can't linger anywhere today, <laughs> we have to go, we got to go. All right, how did we get from this to this? And uh, recognize, I'm not talking about this person as having been a degraded soul or something. His soul to God is made in the image and likeness of God as much as St. Augustine's is. It's the perception of reality that's changed. And uh, you'll, you'll pick up that the title of the book is The Benedict Option, right? And the idea is how do we get back to an, uh, a medieval sort of mindset. In order to do that, you have to understand what prayer is trying to hearken back to and understand medieval or patristic, which means church fathers, uh, philosophy or, or you could say worldview. A couple of quotes. First of all, medievals experienced everything in the world sacramentally. They believed that God was present everywhere and revealed himself to us through people and places and things through which his power flowed. Think of that image of St. Augustine looking out uh, and through his physical world waiting for the divine to inhabit the physical, this world, okay? And he experiences God through the world sacramentally. Another quote, Medieval man held that reality was outside himself. You could see St. Augustine discerning reality from outside himself. And knew that he could not perceive it. He could not fully comprehend it or fully wrap his arms all the way around it and touch on the other side. Because God was in reality and the creature could not comprehend the Creator in that same way that you know your keys are in your pocket. Okay? Uh, and, and, yeah, we'll, we'll stop with the keys in your pocket, but this is a medieval way of looking at the world, is that the world itself and everything around me is not only meaningful, but it's communicating to me about God, and God can be discovered in all things. Not a pantheistic thing, but God is revealing Himself to us, the world, myself, and everything in it, uh, this, this creation is meaningful in itself because God created it. Uh, and now, Rod Dreher calls this metaphysical realism. The best word is real. Uh, if metaphysical is a trick for you, you could say philosophical, or, or basically we're talking about all things, meta all things physical, everything. Okay, metaphysical realism. Humankind back then dwelled not in a cold, meaningless universe, but in a cosmos in which everything had meaning because it participated in the life of the Creator. And we were just blessed to be a part of it. Okay? Here is the Annunciation where the angel uh, Gabriel comes and speaks to St. Mary and something real, physical, tangible happened because God intervened in this world. Uh, We were participating in the life of the Creator in this world. So metaphysical realism, the world is harmonious and all things point to God as part of the mentality, okay? Society is grounded in a higher reality above us. And finally, the world is charged with spiritual force. 
you notice this initial quote, human quiet, humankind dwelled not in a cold, meaningless universe. The suggestion is today, the, uh, the assumption is we live in a cold, meaningless universe out of which you have to create some meaning for yourself and that's the goal of being alive. That is a way, way, way different way to look at the world than, than the medieval mind. Uh, some people say, oh, he's going to take us back to the Middle Ages, as if that was a terrible thing. I think it would be great, actually. <laughs> Not technologically. Uh, you know, and, and you know, for a number of other reasons, okay, now I'm not really talking about that. But this worldview, yes, I am taking you there, actually. That's why our classes oftentimes use the church fathers, because the church fathers uh, have no idea what we're talking about with this cold, meaningless universe. And I'd rather we dwell in the universe where we're participating in the life of the Creator and everything we do, and especially at this church. Um, but, but, but something broke. Actually, a bunch of things broke between the medieval era and today. And he, he lists five, and he admits this is a skipping stone through history. We're just touching five little spots. Yes, we could go deeper on all of this, but the first he points to is called uh, a philosophy called nominalism. Uh, initially, you see here this icon of creation, that God is uh, creating. In the 14th century, William of Ockham denies that realism that we talked about before, that things are meaningful in themselves because God has given them uh, meaning or because God's created them to have their own reality. Uh, William of Ockham denies that realism, trying to protect God's sovereignty. In other words, he says, wait a minute, uh, if a tree is good because it's good in itself, well then it's not good because God said it's good. Let's do away with that and say the tree is good because God says it's good. And if God says it's not good, then it all changes and it's not good. It sounds like we're protecting the character of God and the sovereignty of God. I know this is all heady, but this is, you gotta, you gotta just do it. <laughs> 14th century. Things are good, or things aren't good because they're good in themselves. They're good because God says they're good. That sounds great. We even sing a hymn that says, whatever, the, whatever my God ordains is right. Which is partially right. <laughs> pretty right. Pretty close. But there's a, there's a oops here. Oops. In trying to protect God's sovereignty, we said things have no intrinsic meaning in themselves. God says they have meaning, so they have meaning, which, which protects God's sovereignty in a way. But we accidentally said things aren't meaningful in themselves. It seemed like a safe and okay thing to say until that kudzu seed grew into the seed that <laughs> swallowed the whole forest, okay? But that initial idea, meaning is imposed from the outside. How do we move down to this cold, meaningless universe? With, uh, the f with a single step. This is the first single step, okay? Uh, that's uh, crisis root number one. And I don't want to hustle too fast because we're, we're, we're about to be done with root one. That maybe is the trickiest one to get a hold of because it's so, uh, what's the word? Abstract. And to think that, you know, you tell me that the, the farmer that grows grain and brings it into the market knew what William Ockham was saying? Of course not. But nevertheless, this is how culture works. Some philosopher somewhere has an idea. The idea takes hold and manifests in the community later on, seemingly without our even knowing it, we all suddenly are thinking like William of Ockham. Um, that idea is okay so far as it goes, but it is also the beginning of a problem. Before we go to Renaissance and Reformation, does anybody uh, have any difficulty with nominalism so far? That's a tricky one, uh, nominalism. And the word nominalism means name. In other words, uh, uh, and I, it, it's essentially things don't have a meaning in themselves until they're given a name. That's a real abstract thing, and I'm sorry if that one doesn't sink in, but, but uh, we've got to move on. You perhaps understand nominalism as we, as we continue on. This is one of those chapters, by the way, that you could read about five times and it would do you well. Uh, and I've, I've listened to it 
three or four times and read it once or twice, so I'm on the fifth time now. It's philosophy and history at the, at the same time. But as we move on through time, 14th century, we're going 15th, 16th century, the Renaissance occurs, and there is a real shift from a focus on the glory of God to the glory of man. It, in, it, it occurs in art, it occurs in literature, it occurs in any uh, number of facets in the Renaissance because it is a time of rebirth, and not a rebirth of God and theology, but a rebirth of man, where we return to, and this is a Renaissance painting of ancient philosophers here, we return to something like man is the measure of all things in ancient Greek philosophy. Man is the measure of all things. And in a sense, we're, we're cycling back to a pagan idea but we have just gone from St. Augustine listening to God as the measure of all things to looking at ourselves and saying, I am the measure of all things. That's a Renaissance idea, a rebirth of humanity um, in the West, I'll say. What follows, yeah, I don't know if you could say it was a result of, but nevertheless, uh, a moral decline in Rome, which was the center of the, of the Western Church at that time, of course, and the corruption of the church called for reform. We've got uh, a, a few different crises happening at once. But when the society looks at their own bishops and clergy and says, you all are corrupt, and everything you say is corrupt, and you just want our money, and you just, uh, you've got all kinds of scandals, uh, there, there, there's a call for reform. And the reform comes, first of all, you could say, roughly speaking, through Martin Luther, who unintentionally breaks the universal authority of Rome, the Western Church, and deeply unsettles the Western world, and leaves a question in man's mind in the West, who is running this show? Where do we get the answer for what is and what isn't anymore? If I can't turn to my church, where am I supposed to turn to ask, to, to have an answer to the question, who am I and what am I doing here? What am I supposed to be doing? What's the meaning of any of this? And if, like with William of Ockham, if you can't look to things in themselves anymore, and now you can't trust the authority of the church, or the authority of the church has now been broken and continued to break into several factions, the, the mind of the Western man uh, takes a deep sigh and uh, we're right on the heels of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment is a terrible name. I hate that name. And uh, even worse is the Dark Ages. Ugh, oh, that's, that's a, a, a miserable misnomer, a misnaming of, of two different eras. For the dawn of the Enlightenment uh, is a continuation of I am the measure of all things, Therefore, I am now going to create and understand the world according simply to my own individual uh, or my own independent notions of this world, as I discern them to be, uh, the Enlightenment. And that's, that's discerned to be the, the, the final standing up of the homo erectus, the man who stands up and is finally enlightened in this world. Um, Copernicus... Uh, one of the original ideas. I'm not saying the ideas are essentially wrong, but we're talking about something that's, that is breaking underneath. Copernicus, an upheaval of the cosmos is going on at the time. Uh, it, ironically, we thought we were the center of everything in planet Earth, and we're starting to recognize, wait a minute, the sun is the center of our solar system, and, and our solar system isn't even the center of everything. In other words, the, the mind of Western man is cracking at this point anyway. Everything has to change and be thought of in a new way. Sir Francis Bacon, uh, you know, essentially the founder of, of modern, not modern science, but the founder of, of the scientific method, I believe you could say. Uh, scientific discovery, he says, ought to be applied for the, the relief of man's estate. That all sounds wonderful, and you think about it, everything at Bed Bath & Beyond was created <laughs> for the relief of your estates. Your coffee could be made quicker so that your head would be more comfortable 
so that your bathroom would smell better. It's, uh, all these things some scientist in a lab somewhere is developing to make your life easier. But there's something philosophical about that, which is the world is not, not only not intrinsically meaningful, and not only do I not go to the world to seek its creator, I now use the world and manipulate it for my own good and my own comfort. That's a big change, and much of science, I mean, I can almost say most, almost all of science, is developed uh, and pursued, and the research is done to that end, so that in the end, we will be more comfortable. That's a difference, that's a, that's a change that takes place. It's taking place largely during the Enlightenment. Rene Descartes, one of the major philosophers of the time, uh, I think, therefore I am. Okay? It used to be, and in the Western mind, the Lord himself said, I am that I am. God himself is the founding principle of all reality, and you are created in his image and likeness. You are a little I am. Rene Descartes says, I don't believe that, but I do believe that the foundation of my understanding is that I exist. Um, it's actually, I doubt, therefore I exist. But I, it's essentially, I think, therefore I am. There's no, we, we've broken free of the idea that God says you are, and we've said it to ourselves. We've said the Creator's line to our own selves. I am that I am is, is, is a bit of a thing that's being said here. Uh, we're each of us little I ams, but we've declared ourselves to be. So the Enlightenment, uh, summarized page 35, is an attempt by European intellectuals to find a common basis outside religion for determining moral truth. I will no longer turn to the scriptures to give me an idea of what I ought and ought not to do. I will determine this on my own. This is not the worst thing in the end of the world because nevertheless we are created in the image and likeness of God. And in a lot of ways you can look at yourself and within your own community and discern, determine thou shalt not murder. That's a pretty solid one to start on. I've noticed that lying tends not to build up the community and cheating seems to be a bad thing. Um, honoring my... You know, you can, you can somewhat discern the Ten Commandments just from looking at your own community, but it's largely because only you are made in the image and likeness of God. But this, is start, this today is starting to break down altogether, and we can't even decide whether murder is right or wrong, or whether, whether honoring your father and mother or, or any of these things are right or wrong anymore, because uh, there's, there's been a hollowing out of, of, the, of really uh, the guiding principles of Western thought, which, which were uh, from the church, really, from the scriptures. And so we move on. Uh, we'll have a little time to discuss it at the end. I know it's a whirlwind, but this is recorded. You can look back and listen to it again, or read the chapter again, or talk to me later. Um, then as we move from, really, the 17th century to the 18th and 19th century, we're looking at, really, the Industrial Revolution, and we see a further cracking up of, of a of foundation, another root of the crisis. And so Francis Bacon's notion comes true that all scientific endeavor ought to be for the comfort of, of ourselves, not really the discovery of God's principles or anything like that. And so technology gives way to unprecedented power over nature. This is a new thing. We've found myriad ways now of manipulating the earth and all of creation for our own comforts. And it's, it's turned into uh, the, the Henry Ford's Model T factory. And we're able to put nature in one side, and out the other side on the conveyor belt comes all kinds of comfortable things for us. Um, what happens inside that factory is pretty ugly <laughs> sometimes. What comes out the other side we, we you know, put on our mantle. But uh, inside those factories, uh, something has changed. People have fled the, the agrarian culture 
of the farmer who milked the cow, brought the milk into town, traded the milk for the carrots, brought the carrots home, fed his family. Uh, all of that seems to be going by the wayside and everyone moves to the city to start making yarn, something like that, and that's the only thing we do is yarn. And we're not going to pay, we're not going to take our, our yarn to the, to the storehouse to trade for milk because all, we, we got all the yarn we can handle. How about we give you cash? And so the, the, the community is starting to change, something in the mind is changing here a little bit about that connection to our, our world uh, and uh, finding meaning in the world itself. At the same time, national revolutions, France and the United States, arise against authoritarian structures, which you could say in a, in a myriad ways is a good thing. Nevertheless, individualism is ascending even further, uh, and with individualism comes isolation. Each of us are our own isolated little principled uh, figures in this world. We're, we're once again losing this sort of organic nature of of reality, we're losing this sense of, um, of connectedness that was enjoyed in the medieval era. Uh, uh, one of the main philosophers kicking off this era uh, is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose romantic idea was that man is basically good, and that's a different thing uh, from the fall of man and us being uh, the heart being desperately wicked, who can know it, as the scriptures say. But he says people are basically good if you leave people alone. In fact, he was the one that, that uh, had the idea of the noble savage and even uh, posited a parenting ideal where you just leave the kids alone. If you leave the kids alone, they'll basically raise themselves. And because they're basically good, it's you that's messing them up. Okay? Uh, this, this basic idea that it's society that's messing people up, they're basically good in themselves if you just get rid of society. At the same time, uh, Christianity is going through a change in Germany and in, in the uh, Protestant world under Schleiermacher and, and the like in a romantic era where Christianity has been distilled down in his mind to that good feeling, that good feeling you get at church. That's what really Christianity is about. Not doctrine, not discerning the truth of God, that warmth that you get in your heart on Christmas Eve when you see that wreath, and it just reminds you of your childhood, and they play that song. Ah, oh, that song is the best. And you go home, and there's eggnog, and that's Christianity, that warm, toasty feeling you have inside. And you notice what's been eliminated from the Christian faith at this point is Christ, uh, the incarnation, the, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension. Those things are nice in so much as they make you feel warm and happy, they're good. In so much as they make you feel bad, just leave them aside and we'll tell a warm, fuzzy uh, story about a, a puppy and, and a poem. And that's really what you come to church for, is that good old-fashioned, warm Christian feeling. Uh, this, at the same time as the Communist Manifesto is written, uh, one of the key lines is, all that is solid melts into air. And Marx and Engels look at the world and say, you know what existence is about? It's about power, okay? And then the Christians are saying, no, 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 it's about that feeling, that good feeling. <laughs> And he says, no, 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 we forget the good feeling because he can see uh, Marx uh, was hanging out with seminarians who had basically lost their faith. And he said, oh, am I not getting into this? No way. Marx says, I've got an economic theory that's going to get down to the heart of things. And um, there was a failure of the church there behind Marxism, really. Uh, why did Marx turn out like he did? Ooh, that's a headache. Um, but that idea that the essence of life and the meaning of humanity is about uh, power and about property and not about seeking God as he created things to reveal himself, he sees that in this 19th century, everything solid is just melting into air and disappearing. So we might as well uh, create an iron fist <laughs> to replace 
or uh, what will be left after everything melts into air, an iron fist. Nietzsche, at the end of that century, close to the end of the century, he says, God is dead, and we have killed him. That is misunderstood by a lot of 20th century, 21st century evangelicals, for him to say that the God of the Bible actually you know, went through some death. It's not really what he's talking about. He's talking about the idea of God, the notion that there is meaning and that we can ascend to truth, we've killed it. We've killed that idea. That God is dead, and he didn't die on his own. We killed him. That's the essence of the 19th century to Friedrich Nietzsche. And while the church is, is uh, experiencing uh, revivals on the one hand, oftentimes she is also acquiescing to these ideas and saying, well then, uh, how about a social gospel, where the essence of the Christian faith is doing good things in the community? And we say, great, you should do good things. This is the era of the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army starts in the 19th century. Uh, in the face of this terrifying Nietzsche, Marx kind of worldview, we want to run out into the community and start doing works that will please God. Um, and th those are all good things, but there's, another, there's a part of the brokenness in that idea that you can reduce the Christian faith to doing good stuff. So now you've got feeling good feelings and doing good stuff as the Christian faith. And, uh, well, face that against two world wars in the next century, and the doing good stuff takes a die, it takes a death. Uh, bows out in many, many people's minds. And what's left after... Uh, after the world itself in itself doesn't mean anything anymore, the authority of the church has been really sort of broken up and confused. The focus of the world has become on my own perception of the world, and then my own perception of the world is melting into thin air. Uh, well, I'll just do good deeds, and when good deeds don't work, and you have two world wars that, that crush all that, what you're left is, you know what? If it feels good, do it. There's something real about that, that, you know, there's something romantic about it and despairing about it at the same time. The idea that we're, what we're left with in our modern era, and he, he calls it the sexual revolution, but really it's not necessarily about sex, it's about pleasure. All I've got left in this world is to ask myself, what do I like, and pursue that. <laughs> like, uh, Sigmund Freud is really at the heart of this, proclaimed the self as the deity to replace the Christian religion. And uh, a wonderful quote here, religious man was born to be saved, psychological man is born to be pleased. And um, that's a good one to ponder because of the next quote, um, which is this, the 1960s psychological man triumphs and now owns the culture and most churches. Ooh, okay. <laughs> In other words, people are going to church oftentimes now for purely psychological reasons because they would like to feel good, and that's it. Once a week I go to church to feel good, and it almost doesn't even matter what the priest says or what the, what, the, what the pastor says, as long as he says something uplifting. Have you ever heard Christian music described as uplifting? I feel like, oh, I hate that word. <laughs> <laughs> uplifting. If something is true and good and you're participating in it, it's naturally uplifting. But to say, you know, kittens are beautiful and, and we would like to have kittens everywhere, that's uplifting? That's not uplifting. That's nihilism. That's... <laughs> That's the belief in nothing. Um, the West had not become atheist, but it had spiritualized desire and embraced a secular gospel of self-fulfillment. And many churches have said, oh, I see what our role is. We will help you in your self-fulfillment. The next four weeks will be a sermon series on how to get along with your spouse. The sermon series after that will be how to get out of debt. The sermon series after that will be how to parent your children so that everybody's happy in the end and Christmas is more fun. You know? 
And how far did we get now uh, from St. Augustine sitting there uh, and that medieval worldview? But it gets a little bit worse. We've got five more minutes for even worse. You ready? <laughs> he says, and this, th I'm sorry, this is, this is great and a good thing to get a hold of. For the first time in history, the West was attempting to build a culture on the absence of belief in a higher order that commanded our obedience. In other words, we were creating an anti-culture, one that made the foundation for a stable culture impossible. This is a good one to get a hold of because you realize that in the past we had been seeking for truth and reality and building our culture in, uh, in accordance with a higher principle or a higher order that we were searching for. And now you notice the guiding principles of our culture are tearing down whatever used to be, right? So if what used to be was marriage and we pushed on it and it wobbled, well, let's push harder. And we push harder and find that marriage goes here, and the Supreme Court can't remember why we ever believed in, in the marriage between a man and a woman. And, and you can't turn to the scripture and you can't say it has to do with the Creator, and you can't say it's the image, the icon of Christ in the church, and you can't really say anything other than that what we believe is whatever you feel is right is probably good, as long as you're not hurting anyone. And so you push on it and marriage falls over. And now, it's like a riot, you know what I mean? Someone broke the first part of the wall, and others are saying, well, what about this thing? I wonder if this thing would fall over if I pushed on it. And everyone runs over to start pushing on that. And sure enough, it falls over. And that's why I think we're seeing the, the, the increasingly rapid decline of, of what used to be sort of pillars in the, in the society. The confusion of the, the justice system that really can't remember why it was that we believed we shouldn't do this. And I'll just say, I, uh, I'm not really trying to make this political, but I did listen to a, a, a speech on NPR the other day where a, a woman who was a part of the abortion underground, uh, back before abortion was illegal, she was a part of the underground where that she would organize abortions before uh, Roe versus Wade. Uh, she was congratulated for having been responsible for about 11,000 abortions. And she's basically sort of like the Navy SEALs of, of an abortion organizer, however you want to say it. And then the NPR uh, lady asked her, what do you think of the new law that was passed in Texas? Okay, And she said, I was horrified. <laughs> and I think, horror. To say that the one, the, the, you see how upside down and backwards and, and weird and, and wrong and and, but there was no questioning. Uh, the agreement was, yes, it is horrifying, horror. A horror that this was restricted in Texas. And I thought, wow. And there would be no discussing with those two ladies in NPR. There'd be no discussing. It was horrible. It was a horrible thing. It's tragic. And I'm thinking, hold on. We just talked about 11,000 lives that were lost, innocent lives. But this is horrifying. Anyway, I'm not really, this isn't really about abortion. This is about how did we go uh, from that <laughs> to that? We did it in 40 minutes, right? <laughs> how do we get from this to that? But nevertheless, what I'm trying to tell you and what he is trying to tell you is that, is that it's not reality that has changed. It's the culture's perception of reality that's changed. And in so much as the church is participating in an anti-culture, we need to stop it, okay? In so much as the church is participating in, yes, I'll say medieval, but really a, a, a Christian world that God himself and his intervention in this world, we're good. So what are we doing? <laughs> uh, and I love here because there's friends and there's donuts. No, there isn't. Cookies, there's <laughs> coffee, there's friends. I love that you're here for that, and I'm glad that you have a good feeling when you come to St. George, because that would be the natural outcome of something much more central to the church, which is Christ himself, 
and the incarnate ministry of Christ continues in this church, of course you'll feel good. Of course you'll find friends. And of course we'll have cookies, because why not? You know? But that's not why you came. You came to meet God, and because of that, community. The, the connection between God and man is established and nourished. God, yeah, and so that the connection between man and man can be healthy and established and nourished as well. That's 40 minutes of me talking, and I knew we had to get through this somehow, so I had to just talk through. There's our, cut, there's, there's our explanation of why kudzu is eating this entire universe. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, it is not a hopeless situation, but you've got to understand the problem before you can do something about it. And when someone says, well, why don't we do more touchy-feely things at church to get more people in? I say, no, <laughs> no way. Why doesn't the church, uh, why does the church, that's why, okay? Because that's the essence of the church, and it's the, it's the solution. This comments, uh, yes, please, Amy. Yeah. and important enough people such as why don't What he's saying is you recognize the problem and then you work at the solution. And you'll notice that the Benedict option, there is some despair in here about the, the larger culture, but there uh, the, the beast will eat us alive. Fires put out. Culturally speaking, but the church is 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 the body of Christ, and we've got right. to be the light to the world. That's that's what we've got to do. We've that's exactly got right. To yeah. Retired it. The world we just got to do. Um because the church is saturated in an idea that now says what we're doing here is an intolerable, tolerable bigotry. And that will become more, that idea will become more and more. But as that pressure rises, we shouldn't crumble more and more and say, well, okay, what would you like us to do? No, you, you're, you're right. You set, you're set as a city on a hill, and you're, you're a light to the world, and there's a rock here upon which other, uh, uh, what would you say, other things will be smashed upon this rock, and the rock will not break. So you say, well, George the Martyr Anglican Church, Simpsonville, South Carolina, give me a break. No, 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 there's no give me a break. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's what I'm, that's what I'm good at. He says, you know, don't say the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church in the West. And I say, oh, give me a break. That's because he joined the Eastern Orthodox Church, so he's able to, <laughs> he's able to wag his, his finger at the church. But if we go and swallow the entire zeitgeist and, and hide in our hovel until it's all over, not only will there not be a church here, there won't be a hovel left. <laughs> uh, so, yes, uh, I'm glad everybody's happy and has friends and, and there's cookies and stuff. But uh, what we're doing here is, is is really standing against a decline in humanity, and we're not standing on uh, with the cross of Christ held high. That's uh, Pat. I'm always hopeful that Mark Driscoll is going to celebrate when Darwin came out with his book, and Darwin's book sold out in a day. 
Yeah. You know, his first edition. And, you know, now it's not even required reading because it was so outrageous, so right. you know, boring, um, but the survival of the fittest. But they celebrated it because they knew that they could get through that communist manifesto um, once people didn't think of God as being the creator. Right. So, and I, I think that's all breaking down right now. Yeah. And it, people are going to go back to. It, it could be something like, you know, we're talking about, we're very apt, we've got to stop, but we're apt to talking these days about a flu, right? Flus, but we're, I'm talking about the virus, but I've got the antibodies, <laughs> and uh, I, I, who are the most broken about what's going on in our culture are people that are coming out of communist countries, and they see what's going on here, and it's heartbreaking, and, and we don't even know what we're doing, but we got to stop. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm in trouble if I don't Oh, yeah? Music yeah. Uh, it it's all, has a lot of relevance to this. Yeah. Uh, 71 was when a lot of things happened yeah. culturally, politically, and all that. If you've got some spare time, okay. sometimes it, it meanders, sometimes it's all food. What's it called? The general gist is how society has changed the music. Well, send me, a, that send me a text about that, because on that. Sundays my brain is on fumes, and I'll forget. And so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, oh, thanks. Okay. Father, how are you? Welcome well, here. Yeah, re reluctantly, but <laughs> reluctantly, but I, I, I feel like it's rather I'd rather do the Benedict option than talk about it. So, but I, we're talking about it anyway. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. i got to run around circles for a little yeah, while, yeah, so no I'll talk to you again yeah, soon. Sure. Okay.